Hello everybody, this is Dr. O'Ren, and here we are. Nine days till the AP Lit exam, and this is going to be the final video lecture before you take the exam. Uh, so nine days, or and counting. Maybe it depends on how you look at it, which day you count, but uh, it could be even seven days left if you don't even count the day of the exam. So uh, today we're going to dive in to samples, sample essays, look at scoring rubrics, and uh, then make a final assignment, a final essay. And uh, so I'm just going to start and jump in and, and take, take it away. First thing I want to bring up are these three ways to organize essays that the YouTube presenters on the AP Lit channel gave out in this handout, namely organizing by insight or organizing by the order of the passage, and finally essays that are organized by device. And I agree with them that the insight route is the best way to go, where the essay proceeds through a series of body paragraphs to present insights, various insights, as topic sentences that the essays then support through evidence and commentary. This is absolutely the best way to organize the essay, but as they also point out, these other modes, these other approaches work as well, although they have certain pitfalls, certain dangers you should be aware of. If you're just following the order of the passage in your own essay, you can develop insightful analysis and strong commentary. However, the danger, the risk, is that you lapse into plot summary. So if you're just giving a blow-by-blow -blow plot summary following the order of the passage, that's, that will not be a successful essay. Similarly, if you proceed just by device, if you proceed to present one device and then another device and then another device, in succeeding body paragraphs, that essay will likely not succeed either because you will be proceeding along an and-then organization, which does not develop a line of argument. That said, we're probably most familiar with the device essay because the prompts and the examples, the sample essays that we look at most often contain those sort of essays, those sort of device-organized essays. So I do want to suggest that if you do a device-centered organization, a device-organized essay, that the thing to keep in mind is, is you can do, the, do it successfully as long as you assert after pointing out the device the function of that device. So the device functions to X, Y, or Z. The device suggests some larger insight or connects to some larger thought. As long as you are connecting the device to a thought, to an insight, to an interpretation, to an analysis, an inference, then that's fine. You'll be successful. And I think you can carry it off without a problem. So with that in mind, no matter which option you choose, however you organize the essay, let's just review the basic principles to keep in mind to satisfy the line of, of reasoning requirement in the essay. So you need to impose a useful order on your argument. No matter how you order the argument, make some kind of gesture in the argument, in your writing, that connects the pieces of your argument, conveys to a reader that th there is a logic to the order of your argument. So whether using transitions effectively to do this or other gestures in your writing, make sure that the reader comes away seeing a, a building and a building order to your argument. So the principle of organization must be logical, logical connection, therefore arguments, not and then arguments. A leads to B leads to C, or A builds up to B um, and B connects to C. So the definition of line of reasoning that they're looking for is a logical sequence of claims that work together to defend the overarching thesis statement. So today we're going to look at two test cases and then a third test case which will actually serve as 
the assignment, the next essay assignment that I am asking you to do before the exam. So let's take a look at this prose fiction analysis prompt and the requirements that the prompt will list uh, instructions for you to proceed with the essay. So let's read it together, take it apart a little bit, and then we'll look at some rubrics, some scoring guides, and then some samples. The excerpt found here is from William Dean Howell's novel, The Rise of Silas Lapham, 1885. In this passage, the author describes two sisters, Penelope and Irene, read the passage carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how Howells uses literary elements and techniques to portray the complex experience of the two sisters within their family and society. So you're familiar with this prompt. You've actually written the essay. We have looked at some of these samples, so much of this will come as review. But let's just notice in the passage, the prompt, that uh, I've highlighted the phrase uses literary elements and techniques. So the prompt is directing you to think about literary elements or techniques, devices, anything that you notice, patterns that the author is using in order and then to portray, to portray, to portray, depict. Again, that will be a common verb, a common phrase the prompts will use to ask you to demand that you respond to that question. How, so the question is, how does the passage portray? How does it portray the topic? And so the topic is complex experience and included is uh, in the experience of the two sisters in the context of their family, society. So we understand what the topic is. The question is, how is the passage portraying that topic? Now, once again, I wanna suggest that all you have to do at first is just think, is that portrait, is that de the portrayal, is, is the way it's depicting the topic, is it pro or is it con? And then fr from there, you can complicate it. So it, it, they do say it's complex experience. That's a hint. They are expecting you to come back with a complicated thesis, a thesis that acknowledges the, the, comple the complexity of the topic complexity of the portrayal. So again, start off with a pro or con, but make sure that you represent that complexity in your thesis. Let's look at things responses should do. You should respond to the prompt with a thesis that presents a defensible interpretation. Select and use evidence to support your line of reasoning. Explain how the evidence supports your line of reasoning and use appropriate grammar and punctuation in communicating your argument. Here's the point. You've got to present a defensible thesis in your intro. Then in your body paragraphs, you have to develop a line of reasoning. Start off with a topic sentence that makes an assertion. Then present evidence to back up that assertion. Finally, explain how does the evidence, how does the device, whatever you notice, how is that effective in contributing, in supporting the larger assertion that you're making. So let's take a look at this scoring guide, the scoring rubric, and this one is on the thesis. Again, the, the point is you've got to present a defensible interpretation, defensible thesis that in response to the prompt. So let's look at responses that don't earn the point. One Here's one that restates the prompt. Howells portrays the experience of the sisters as, a, as complex through a variety of literary elements. Here it's just restating the prompt. It's saying that the thesis statement is saying that Howells is portraying the experience, but it doesn't say how he's portraying the experience, ex other than that he's doing it through a complex variety of literary elements. But what are those elements? And what is Howells' take on the experience? The writer doesn't say that. So therefore, it doesn't receive a point. Here's one that makes a generalized comment. Howells illustrates the importance of fashion. Well, one, importance doesn't tell us too much. Is it important in a good way, important in a bad way? But moreover, this doesn't respond to the prompt. There's no connection to the topic that the prompt points us to. Finally, here's one that's just descriptive. It's just describing, just describing features. From the beginning of the excerpt, Howell 
depicts the way of lives of two sisters, Penelope and Irene. This seems to me just mere summary, so no points are awarded for that kind of response. Let's take a look at a couple of examples that did earn the point. In Howell's novel, two sisters, Penelope and Irene, did not care for the views of society, but for themselves. To me, this seems borderline. One question might be, so what? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? But this scoring rubric determines that this is a, a claim. This is a claim that requires the writer to prove it and support it. So therefore, it, it receives a point. The second one, this excerpt discusses the lavish yet helpless lives of Sister Irene and Penelope in a satirical way in an attempt to explain the seemingly selfish lives of the Laphams. The author highlights the clueless and unaware sisters through detailed examples and a satirical tone. So I think this thesis gets it on several fronts. One, by asserting that the portrayal is satirical, so it's mocking or making fun of the Laphams or of some other aspect. And then it's asserting that these devices or tactics are used to highlight the clueless and unaware sisters. So there's somewhat of a claim there through the devices, through the tactics. Those are being used to do something to highlight clueless and unaware sisters. I don't think highlights is a particularly analytical verb, but this thesis cover the, covers the bases. So here are three steps to a thesis I think you could use. Now, of course, you have your own method, your own way of doing it. Stick with that. But, but the first thing to do is to determine what the topic is. Here, the topic is complex experience, but that includes the, both the sisters and family and society. That's what you're being asked to determine what position, what view, how, how it's being portrayed by the, by the passage. Step two, decide if the passage conveys a pro or contra stance or attitude on that topic. You can think about that in various ways. So is the relationship between the sisters a good one, bad one? Or you could think, how do the sisters relate to society? Or how do the sisters relate to the family? So there is complexity there, and there are different angles that you can construe the portrait or portrayal the way that the passage portrays it. But ultimately, you should consider whether the passage is supporting something or is critiquing it or something in between. Finally, write a sentence asserting that the author uses X, Y, or Z devices, tactics, in order to convey that specific view, thought, message, insight, or stance on the topic. So you're doing two things. One, you're asserting that the passage takes a specific view or stance on the topic, but you're also asserting that the author is using various devices, specific devices, in order to support that stance, in order to support that view, that message, thought, insight, whatever, on the topic. Getting the thesis point should be easy, shouldn't be that difficult, and shouldn't take up that much space and time in your essay. But this is the big section, the evidence and commentary section. So let's take a look at the three to four columns, because uh, zero to two, are not going to make it, they're not going to cut it. And I think we know what those look like just by looking at the three and four. So they are what the three and four are not. So let's look at three points. Evidence. Provide specific evidence to support all claims in a line of reasoning. Every time you give a claim, you're presenting evidence. That's it. Every time you, you make an assertion, and you've got to make an assertion, in each paragraph you have to make an assertion that supports a line of reasoning, once you give the assertion, you've got to give evidence. Now, the commentary for the three points explains how some of the evidence supports a line of reasoning. Now, you can deduce that the commentary is not explaining how all of the evidence supports a line of reasoning. And the commentary explains how at least one literary technique or element in the passage contributes to its meaning. So if you're doing some of this some of the time, then you're likely to get three points. But for four points, you have to be doing it all of it, all of the time. You're making claims in each paragraph. You're providing specific evidence to support each of those claims, all of those claims. And every time you're presenting the evidence, you are 
commenting on it, you're explaining it, how that's evidence specifically, how that specific evidence supports your line of reasoning. And you're employing multiple literary elements or techniques in your analysis, or I should say you are attending to multiple literary elements or techniques in your analysis. Let's just take a look at the bottom box under additional notes and the final bullet point. To earn the fourth point in this row, the response may observe multiple ins instances of the same literary technique or element if each instance further contributes to the meaning of the passage. So it's not entirely clear there what they mean by further contributes to the meaning of the passage. I think it's probably best to err on the side of throwing in multiple literary elements or techniques, but if you're developing one specific element through multiple instances, then you can still get the four points. So let's return again to the three possible ways you could approach or your essay organization, the insight or the order of the passage or by device. And I wanna just show a couple of topic sentences that you could use that combine both the device and the insight driven essay. So if you look at the first example, the first topic sentence, contrasts the narrator draws between herself and her brother hint at diametrically opposed methods of coping with childhood traumas. This is from my Beat Queen essay, the basic version. And you can see here that I combine both the device and the insight. So I identify the device, contrasts, and then I give an analytical verb which suggests function. So the contrasts are functioning to, or they're hinting at, and then I provide the, the insight, these diametrically opposed methods. The contrasts at one basic level are pointing to a deeper level, a different level, having to do with methods and approaches. And then of course, from there, I can determine whether one is above the other, one is superior to the other. Does the text suggest that one is a better method of coping? Or is there a more complicated argument going on? Let's take a look at the second topic sentence, the loss of their father looms over the passage. Here, I haven't given a, a device. I haven't pointed to a particular element. It's just a kind of insight. It's kind of insight, but it doesn't go that far away from observation. But look how I follow it up in the paragraph. The image of the sparkling stones reminds readers of the earlier simile when the narrator sees the train, dot, dot, dot. And the larger insight is that all of this connects to the idea, the thought that the father is gone. Those elements, devices, images, similes, all point to the absence of the father. So in other words, I give the insight, then I mix in a device or a tactic and connect that device or tactic to the insight, to a larger thought. Of course, what's missing here in the topic sentence is the commentary. And that, of course, you have to provide in the paragraph. That's essential. Always need to explain how the evidence contributes, how that device contributes effectively to supporting the larger thought, the larger insight you've presented. The final example, the narrator's first person point of view. So I've identified the device, identified the element. Further functions too. I've attached a verb, an analytical verb to that element. Functions to hide her vulnerability behind a tough exterior. There's the insight, there's the thought. There's the idea that the element connects to. The element serves to connect to this larger idea. And I've given both the elements and the idea. So here's the formula that we could break this down into. X device functions to, so functions to or some other verb that, that connects to Y thought slash insight. If you provide all of these, you set up your analysis. Now you need to explain how that's the case, how this is effectively contributing to that insight. But this essentially sets you up to cover all of the bases. <laughs> So look how many different ways you can construe this formula. Obviously, this is just a handful of ways, but X device functions to support Y thought, X device slash word suggests Y thought, X device hints at Y thought, X symbolizes Y thought, X image implies Y thought, X device works to convey Y thought, X device conveys Y thought, X observation connects to Y thought or insight. So if you see on the left side, the beginning of the sentence, you're presenting the observation. The verb connects you to the insight, connects you to the inference. So you're traversing from observation to insight 
or inference. Obviously, you still need to explain how that's the case. How is it effectively doing that? And you need to point specifically to features, specific features of that device in explaining how they connect to the thought. So another way to frame this is that you can turn whatever device observation feature, tactic, whatever thing you notice, turn that into a doer and then ask, what is it doing? Make that doer the subject of an analytical verb that does something that connects to, builds, suggests a thought or insight. If you're doing that in sentences in your body paragraphs, particularly in topic sentences, that sets you up to succeed with your analysis and explanation after you present the evidence. So the key to commentary in your analysis, explain how specific features of the device are effective in supporting some larger thought or insight you are focusing on in the body paragraph. Remember, refer to those specific features and then explain how they are effective in suggesting a larger thought. So let's take a look at the prompt again. The prompt is asking, how is the author using literary ele elements and techniques to portray this complex experience of these two sisters within their family and society? And here's sample C. Let's read it together and break it down. From an excerpt of his The Rise of Silas Lapham, William Dean Howell portrays sisters Penelope and Irene as dependent on their family, yet independent from society through selection of detail, words focused on self-reliance, and a significant shift in tone in order to challenge why we feel the need to constantly seek accept the acceptance and adoration of others, but also warn against the dangers of living an overly sheltered life. So this introduction absolutely gets the point. It could be broken up into two sentences. It gets a little convoluted, but look at what they're doing. They're characterizing the complexity of the two sisters as being dependent on the family, yet independent from society. They're suggesting that these features, these techniques and tactics work or function in order to do something. What are they working in order to do? Challenging and also warning. These two larger claims that the essay is making. So it gets the point. Paragraph two, first body paragraph. Howell has a careful selection of detail to show. So here we have identification of the tactic, identification of the device, and then some kind of an analytical verb. Show is a bit of a weak analytical verb, but it works in, it works well enough here. Howell has a careful selection of detail to show how these sisters are different from other girls of that time period. In fact, the excerpt opens with, they were not the girls who, which implies that these sisters deviated from the social norm. The younger sister Irene dressed herself very stylishly and spent hours on her toilet every day, which was not so others could see and admire her, but simply for her own contentment because the Laphams lived richly to themselves. Howell shows how in theory, there is nothing particularly destructive about the mindset that family can rely on each other and live for each other. In account of the eldest daughter, Howell shows how she went to many church lectures on a vast variety of secular subjects and made fun of nearly everything. Her wit deterred potential suitors, differentiating her from the marriage-obsessed girls of her day. Through highlighting the sister's odd social behavior but apparent contentment and peace, Howell criticizes how most girls and families are obsessed with impressing others and climbing up the social ladder. There's a lot going on in this paragraph, and you can see how the writer is moving from these observations to this larger inference, to this larger insight or thought that the details are suggesting difference, the details are working, are functioning in order to reinforce this difference between the girls, the sisters, and other kinds of girls, or the girls and, and society, and making a larger critique of marriage-obsessed girls. Paragraph three, body paragraph two, Howell uses words like self-guided, self-improvement, and mutual affection to highlight the strong but isolated bonds that the Lapham family shares. The Laphams are implied to be not of great social status because a great gulf divided them from wealthier families. However, the Laphams had no skill or courage to make themselves noticed, but more specifically, the elder daughter did not care for society apparently. They are described as lurking helplessly, looking on and not knowing how to put themselves forward in social settings which could be of detriment to the daughters when they want to get married. 
Of course, a liberal perspective would claim there is no need for the daughters to get married, but as social norms of the day define, it is pure ignorance that the Laphams sheltered their daughters so much from social interaction. Here, Howell warns against over-reliance of family and groups for support, because once you're in, you may find it hard to get out. Once again, you can see how the writer is weaving observations and quotes and evidence, and then connecting that to larger thought, a larger idea that they're trying to convey, they're trying to develop this line of reasoning. And in this case, they're shifting. The previous paragraph was suggesting, suggesting something good about the Lapham, something good about their approach, their, the way that they're being portrayed. But here, the writer is detecting a shift in the way that that portrayal is unfolding, the way they're approaching society, which has a downside, has a, has a detriment. Now, you can also notice there are plenty of mistakes in this essay, grammatical mistakes, almost run-on sentences, even leaving off the S in the author's name, but this is an effective analysis that covers all the bases. Let's look at the final two paragraphs. Howell finally shifts his tone from objective and observant to critical of the success of sheltering from societal values and mannerisms from line 58 and onwards. Irene attracts the attention of one man, but is completely at a loss on how to act, for so wholly had she depended on her mother and sister for her opinions, she began for the first time to form ideas which she has not derived from her family. Howell illustrates the importance in thinking for yourself, for although her family's nonconformity suited them, Irene was only conforming to her family's beliefs. With almost contrasting and ironic messages, Howell calls for his readers to seek a balance of conformity to social norms and individualism, all the while discerning yourself what fraction of each should guide your actions and thoughts. I have to say I'm a little surprised this essay doesn't receive the sophistication point because I think the evidence and commentary are rather sophisticated. They do track this complexity throughout the essay, but it doesn't receive the point because it's not convincing, clear, and focused enough to maintain level of complexity for the sophistication point. But it does everything right on the analysis and commentary. Every time there's an assertion, there's evidence to back it up, and some kind of thought, some kind of insight that it connects to, and an explanation how that evidence is effective in contributing to that thought. Quotations are woven in with the analysis effectively. So this is an excellent example or model for the evidence and commentary. Let's take a look at a range of thesis statements that also got the point for this essay. And you can, you can see I am kind of amazed that some of them get the point. So this is all goes to show how you can get the point, even with a minimal statement. Let's look at the first one. The social world and the world of the family sit in opposition. The tension between familial intimacy and the inaccessibility of society organize their experience. So this is considered to have responded to the prompt with a defensible interpretation of the passage. Let's look at the other three. In the novel, two sisters of different nature both view societal point of view as foreign. Howells uses a plethora of literary devices such as style, tone, and selection of detail when portraying the sister's conflicted experience due to society's influence. Howell shows that the sisters are isolated from the world outside the home and unable to communicate with the people they meet. This gets the point. To me, I'm not sure I see a claim here. I see a lot of nice observations, but it does enough to imply that this isolation is an inability to communicate is a bad thing. So the portrait, the portrayal is on the con side. Next thesis statement, the two sisters have very similar upbringings, yet differ from one another immensely. The author uses selection of detail along with symbolism to convey the differences and similarities between the sisters' life experiences. This one barely gets the point because of the word yet, so it's implying that this difference, implying that this difference is something. It's not even clear whether that difference is pro or con, supports pro or con, but there you have it, it gets the point. Finally, and this I think is extraordinary that it gets the point, but here we go. Irene and the eldest daughter have two completely different views on life, and it is described through style, tone, and selection of detail. So the writer is noticing there are two different views, so there is some kind of contrast. How are they different? In what sense are they different? And then is that, and then what's the larger message? Is that 
Is it a pro or a con? Is one side better than the other? The writer doesn't tell us, and yet they still get the point. What I would say is don't walk this dangerously. Don't come so close to not getting the point. But understand that it doesn't take that much to get the thesis point. So again, let's just notice in this breakdown, the essay gets five out of six, one out of one for the thesis, four out of four for the evidence and commentary, zero out of one for the sophistication. Didn't present a convincing case and wasn't focused enough to maintain this level of complexity for the sophistication point. Okay, let's move on to our second an analysis, prose analysis essay, the second sample. And so here's the prompt to that second sample. Again, something that you've already seen and done, but this is, so this is review, but let's break it down and then take a look at a sample. So here's the thing though, apparently this year, prompts will look different. They won't include features that you're used to seeing. They won't include the author and date, possibly even the title and they won't direct you to specific devices. So let's look at the new prompt version of this prompt instead of the one I have highlighted. In this passage, two characters who have been living on the Blythedale farm, a community designed to promote an ideal of equality achieved through communal rural living, are about to part ways. Read the passage carefully. Then, in a well-written essay, analyze how the author uses literary elements and techniques to portray the narrator's complex attitude toward Zenobia. So what I've highlighted in the original prompt was this notion of an ideal of equality. So that's going to come into play in some significant way. I've highlighted the author using literary elements and techniques. You're going to need to point out devices, tactics, things you notice. Once again, we're dealing with a portrait, a portrayal depiction, and you need to decide what stance it takes on the narrator's complex attitude toward Zenobia. So the topic is the narrator's complex attitude toward Zenobia, but it has something to do with this community and its ideal of equality. And because it's complex, your thesis needs to reflect that complexity. It shouldn't totally reduce it down to a pro or con, or if it does, it should admit or acknowledge the complexity that leads to the pro and for con. So when you're responding, you don't need to refer to the specific title or name the author. You can just say in the passage or in this excerpt, and then also just say the author uses, etc. Let's take a look at the examples that don't earn the thesis point. Hawthorne portrays the narrator's attitude toward Zenobia through a variety of literary techniques. So it just restates the prompt. There is portrayal and there are literary techniques involved. Okay. But how is it portrayed? What literary text techniques are involved? Here's just a generalized comment. Hawthorne illustrates the importance of wealth and beauty. Is importance pro or con? But more important, how does this connect to the prompt, to the topic identified in the prompt? Thesis, that's pure description. The passage makes skilled use of diction, imagery, and details. Responses that do earn the point and present a defensible interpretation. Through the use of strongly unfavorable diction to underscore Zenobia's unpleasant and false disposition and repeated insistences on her action as performance, Hawthorne portrays the narrator's attitude towards Zenobia as one of contempt and disapproval. This one hits on all cylinders, giving specific tactics and devices, connecting how those tactics and devices function to a particular idea or characterization, and then characterizing the narrator's attitude and the portrayal of that attitude. Here's a minimally acceptable thesis. The narrator feels as though Zenobia may not be entirely authentic. This seems almost observation to me, but it does get the point, perhaps because it implies some kind of por portrait, some kind of portrayal. Let's take a look at sample E. Intro paragraph. You'll notice that there are a number of errors in these essays that basically can be overlooked, but they are there. How do you reconcile your former understanding of someone with the new person they appear to be? In the given passage, Nathaniel Hawthorne's narrator struggles to accept the seemingly new version of Zenobia, and frustrated with the superficiality she employs, attempts to break her facade and to gauge a more honest understanding of who she has become. Through the use of strongly unfavorable diction to underscore Zenobia's unpleasant and false disposition and repeated instances of her actions as performance, 
Hawthorne portrays the narrator's attitude towards Zenobia as one of contempt and disapproval. So this was one of the thesis, uh, thesis statements that we just looked at. First body paragraph, paragraph two, the passage opens with the narrator observing in awe the luxuries of Zenobia's home. It is beautiful, the fulfillment of every fantasy of the imagination. But although the narrator is dazzled, he is uneasy and feels a bit a bitter sense of shame. Hawthorne magnifies this feeling of shame through terms such as costly self-indulgence and redundance of personal ornament. The narrator expresses his disapproval of Zenobia's over and overly indulgent lifestyle, which is fundamentally different from the values of his own community. He further states his dislike of, dis of Zenobia when he says he malevolently beholds her true character, implying Zenobia has been hiding her true personality by claiming she is a passionate, luxurious woman, lucky, lacking simplicity, not deeply refined, incapable of pure and perfect taste. The narrator harshly criticizes her debauchery and makes evident his disapproval. So there are a number of mistakes here, but you can see that the writer is giving characterization, starting with the awe, then shifting to shame, tr tracing these shifts in the passage and then analyzing them, connecting to them to some larger thought that this shift leads to, namely the implication that this is all just a performance, that the portrait is taking the con position. Paragraph three, second body paragraph, Throughout the passage, the narrator's contempt for Zenobia is also, can't read it, by his criticism of her superficiality. He describes her as an illusion, a great action, underscoring her habit of hiding her true self and authentic emotions. The narrator repeatedly states that Zenobia seems to be acting and wonders when, or if ever, he has beheld her in her truest attitude. Evidently, this defining falseness causes the narrator to both distrust and detest Zenobia. He longs to witness a genuine reaction from her, whether good or bad, simply to learn is she capable and willing of any form of emotional vulnerability. This thirst for a glimpse of something true reveals his struggle to accept this new version of the woman he once knew, who has now become self-complacent, condescending, and inauthentic. So again, a lot of mistakes here, difficult to read in places, but there's an assertion about the portrayal, the, the con side that is criticism, the evidence that backs it up using specific word choices, and then commentary that are suggesting these word choices are supporting this larger con position. Last paragraph. Throughout the passage, the narrator's criticism of Zenobia and her extravagant lifestyle reveal his attitude towards her to be one of extreme disapproval and contempt. It is clear that he is deeply frustrated at her false exterior and longs for her to abandon such toxic superficiality and unabashedly expose her true character, although the narrator momentarily succeeds in getting Zenobia to show him the true flesh and blood of her heart. However, she quickly returns to her proud and self-processed act and shows that she desires to continue her life of pretense. So this one gets perfect six out of six, one for the thesis, four out of four for the commentary and evidence, one out of one for sophistication. I'm not sure I see it. I'm not sure I see how this is that much better than the previous essay, but it gets it according to the readers because there is a complex literary argument that demonstrates sophisticated thought rendered in persuasive prose. One hint may be in the point that the essay recognizes the contradictory aspects of the narrator's attitude. So it's recognizing these complicated and contradictory responses in the narrator and works its way through that, that complex through that complexity. And for that, the readers give it this sophistication point. Okay, let's conclude by going over the last homework before the exam, an essay. So here's the prompt. I'm gonna give you the prompt, we'll go over it, we'll take a look at the scoring guide once more, and then we'll read the pass passage, and that will be it. That will be your homework assignment before the essay, due before the, sorry, before the exam. And um, so I hope everybody does this to prepare for the exam. And let's take a look and get down to it. What I've given you is a new stable prompt version of this same prompt. This I've turned an earlier prompt into what it would look like on the new exam. So this is a good way to practice for the exam as well by 
dealing with the new prompt. In this passage, a narrator from the Caribbean describes the beginning of a new phase in her life. Read the passage carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how the author uses literary elements and techniques to portray the complexity of the narrator's new situation. Notice that I've highlighted in blue phrases like from the Caribbean and new phase. That's crucial information. Now, you don't have the title, you don't have the author, but that is information that can come can have some relevance in your interpretation. Somebody is starting a new phase, uh, is from the Caribbean. The emphasis on literary elements and techniques, although they're not pointing you to specific ones, you're gonna have to come up with those on your own. And then once again, that crucial verb to portray. Question is, what kind of portrait? How is it de being depicted? Is it, is it a good portrait? A portrait saying it's a good thing? Is it a portrait saying it's a bad thing? Is it a portrait that's just being very honest or very, very clear and objective uh, and giving both the good and the bad. Now the word is now the word complexity also is one you want to take note of. The your thesis, your argument needs to reflect in some way the complexity that it's not just a black or white answer, black or white position, that there are different competing elements you have to take account of. And then the topic is the narrator's new situation. How is the new situation getting portrayed, right? It's a complex new situation. So how is the complexity of this new situation getting portrayed? Pro or con? Or somewhere in the middle, in some other permutation. Now, take note, you've got to respond to the prompt with a thesis that presents a defensible interpretation. You have to select the right kind of evidence that supports a line of reasoning. Then you have to explain how does this evidence support your line of reasoning. And you are trying to develop a line of reasoning where it's not just one device and then another device and then another device. It's how does this device function? How does it lead to a larger point, a larger insight, a larger thought? And how do you connect that to other larger thoughts, larger insights, larger um, inferences that all support this, this, bigger, this bigger position, this bigger thesis, this bigger stance that you are arguing the text is taking on the topic. Let's quickly look at the scoring rubric for the thesis and start with the thesis examples that don't earn the point. The, just simply restating the prompt. Kincaid's narrator makes adept use of literary devices when discussing the complexity of her new situation. Yes, she uses literary devices. Yes, it's a complex new situation. The prompt told us that, so you haven't said anything that the prompt didn't already say. Doesn't respond to the prompt, but makes a generalized comment. The, narrator's, the narrator in Kincaid's novel demonstrates the importance of home and belonging. Okay, importance doesn't tell us whether it's good or bad, but uh, it also just doesn't respond to the prompt. The prompt is asking about the, new, the complexity of the new situation and how that's uh, getting portrayed. Finally, just purely descriptive thesis, Kincaid uses very detailed description of places and contrasting of those places. Okay, those are some techniques, but then to develop the narrator's experience. So it's, do you see how it's just a description that the narrator is having this experience you're just describing that, but there's no position that the the text is taking on that experience. There's no there's no claim. It's just an observation. You haven't responded. You haven't sussed out what's the overall take on that experience. What's the text's stance? What's its position? What's its view on the complex new situation? So here are responses that do earn the point. Kincaid, through the use of imagery, m dashes, and repetition, revealed her complex dilemma of wanting to go home or staying in a newer environment. So this is minimally acceptable. They have the techniques, they have the, the tactics, and then really just restate the situation, but at least uh, they acknowledge that there's a dilemma, that the new situation creates this dilemma and so I suppose they're giving the writer the point for that.
So in other words, they don't they don't say how the dilemma is portrayed, uh, what side the text is supporting in that dilemma. Do they go to the one or the other? Second one, in 1990, Jamaica Kincaid's novel Lucy depicts this life change and the narrator's feelings. Kincaid uses repetition of phrases, diction that elicits pathos, and a mood of uncertain and questioning to show how the narrator feels unsure and worried about moving from her hometown and how, despite a chance to restart her life, she still wants to go back. So this doesn't give us a particular insight or overall illumination about the about why this is significant or what the larger point might be, but they do connect the tactics and the devices to larger ideas, emotions, feelings, and so on. And so there is a certain claim being made here that needs to be supported and defended. Just a reminder on the evidence and commentary that you need to always make a claim, make an assertion for each paragraph, make some kind of assertion that goes beyond evidence, some kind of assertion that goes beyond the text to a thought, to an idea that connects, hooks back to the topic. And every time you give an assertion, you always have to provide relevant and specific evidence. And then you need to explain how does that evidence, how does that the quote, how does it support this larger thought, this larger insight that goes beyond the obvious? Explain how that works. Explain how it functions. And you also want to address several multiple literary elements or techniques. And then explain how those elements or techniques function, how they contribute to the meaning of the passage. Again, you want to do it all the time in, in every instance. Always provide evidence, then always comment on that evidence to explain how it supports your argument. Finally, to just review sophistication. You're not going to get the sophistication point if you're just making sweeping generalizations to try to put context to your analysis. So avoid just universalizing sweeping generalizations. Don't only hint at uh, other possible interpretations just by giving a, a single phrase or a little sentence that suggests there's another way of viewing the reading. You have to go further than that. You can't just make a single statement about how your interpretation leads to a larger understanding, a larger theme in the text. You have to follow it up with a more substantial, with more substantial comment. If you're reducing complexities in the passage, you're oversimplifying things, that's not going to get you a sophistication point. And if you're using language that's ineffective, that won't deliver the sophistication point. Responses that do earn the point, identify and explore complexities or tensions within the passage, illuminating the student's interpretation by situating it within a broader context, accounting for alternative or al interpretations of the passage, employing a style that is consistently vivid and persuasive. All of those are ways that you can earn the, the point. You don't have to do all of them. Any one of them could earn the point. The additional note, the point is only awarded if the sophistication is part of the student's argument, not merely a phrase or reference. So it has to be cultivated throughout the essay. Let's take a look at the prompt again. Recall the author is Caribbean. In the passage, the narrator is describing a new phase in her life. You're going to try to think about what are the elements, literary techniques the writer uses to portray the complex new situation, the complexity of the new situation, and how is it portraying that, that situation. So let's just read the text, read the passage, and this will also be available to you on School Loop and Remind, but let's go over it now. And before I send this out, I got into an elevator, something I had never done before. And then I was in an apartment and seated at a table, eating food just taken from a refrigerator. In the place I had just come from, I always lived in a house, and my house did not have a refrigerator in it. Everything I was experiencing, the ride in the elevator, being in an apartment, eating day-old food that had been stored in a refrigerator, 
was such a good idea that I could imagine I could I would grow used to it and like it very much. But at first it was all so new that I had to smile with my mouth turned down at the corners. I slept soundly that night, but it wasn't because I was happy and comfortable. Quite the opposite. It was because I didn't want to take in anything else. That morning, the morning of my first day, the morning that followed my first night, was a sunny morning. It was not the sort of bright sun yellow making everything curl at the edges almost in fright that I was used to, but a pale yellow sun, as if the sun had grown weak from trying too hard to shine. But still it was sunny, and that was nice and made me miss my home less. And so, seeing the sun, I got up and put on a dress, a gay dress made out of madras cloth, the same sort of dress that I would wear if I were at home and setting out for a day in the country. It was all wrong. The sun was shining, but the air was cold. It was the middle of January, after all. But I did not know that the sun could shine and the air remain cold. No one had ever told me. What a feeling that was. How can I explain? Something I had always known, the way I knew my skin was the color brown of a nut rubbed repeatedly with a soft cloth, or the way I knew my own name, something I took completely for granted. The sun is shining, the air is warm, was not so. I was no longer in a tropical zone, and this realization now entered my life like a flow of water dividing formerly dry and solid ground, creating two banks, one of which was my past, so familiar and predictable that even my unhappiness then made me happy now just to think of it. The other, my future, a gray blank, an overcast, seascape on which rain was falling and no boats were in sight. I was no longer in a tropical zone, and I felt cold inside and out, the first time such a sensation had come over me. In books I had read, from time to time, when the plot called for it, someone would suffer from homesickness. A person would leave a not very nice situation and go somewhere else, somewhere a lot better, and then long to go back where it was not very nice. How impatient I would become with such a person, for I would feel that I was in a not very nice situation myself, and how I wanted to go somewhere else. But now I, too, felt that I wanted to be back where I came from. I understood it. I knew where I stood there. If I had to draw a picture of my future then, it would have been a large gray patch surrounded by black, blacker, blackest. What a surprise this was to me, that I longed to be back in the place that I came from, that I longed to sleep in a bed I had outgrown, that I longed to be with people whose smallest, most natural gesture would call up in me such a rage that I longed to see them all dead at my feet. Oh, I had imagined that with my one swift act, leaving home and coming to this new place, I could leave behind me as if it were an old garment never to be worn again, my sad thoughts, my sad feelings, and my discontent with life in general, as it presented itself to me. In the past, the thought of being in my present situation had been a comfort, but now I did not even have this to look forward to, and so I lay down on my bed and dreamt I was eating a bowl of pink mullet and green figs cooked in coconut milk, and it had been cooked by my grandmother, which was why the taste of it pleased me so, for she was the person I liked best in all the world, and those were the things I liked best to eat also. There you have it. That's the prompt. That's the rubric. And that's the passage. You will have access to these on Remind and School Loop as well. So now you need to get down to business, write the essay, do the essay before the exam next week, do the other essays as well before the exam next week, watch the other video lectures, and let's get in shape. Let's prepare for this. So good luck, everybody, but you've got to do this work and get prepared for the exam. All right, see you next time.